Listen, I, I can't top the testimony that Caleb gave earlier. Amen? I, I, can't, I can't compete. And listen, we, we have already experienced the gospel this morning. And Caleb's story, if nothing else this morning, Caleb's story ought to make you be thinking right now of that one person in your life that you keep thinking, Lord, save him, Lord, save him. And, and just have the courage this week to share Christ with that person. Because God may be working, may already be stirring, and he's just waiting for you to be faithful. Amen? Let's, let's think about the possibilities here. I mean, God is at work, and we want to continue to see him work, and I pray that you will get involved in the work yourself. Because it's one thing to passively participate in the work of the kingdom, but it's another thing altogether to be actively involved in the work of the kingdom. So join in, brothers and sisters. Join in because the water's fine. All right? So let's go to chapter 6 in Acts, the book of Acts, as we continue our series. And the big picture of this series is we are looking at what it looks like when the Spirit moves among us. And as I've already shared with you, we don't have to just look here in the Scriptures. We're starting to see it in our church today. Amen? So we look to the Word, though, to see the model and the guide for us as a church. And we see here in Acts the Spirit moving among us. But here in this particular section, beginning in Acts 6, verse 1, we began a new subsection of this larger series where we're looking at how when God's church is doing its work, actively doing kingdom work, there's going to be demonic opposition. And last week we talked about that demonic opposition in terms of its subtleties, and we looked there at the calling of, of those First, maybe deacons, we, 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 we said last week that maybe that's what's going on there. The technical term isn't used, but the point is God begins to call out men from the church to serve the church. Unity uh, comes, but it, it comes only after a little bump in the road as people began to complain in the church and to be concerned about ministry needs. And it seemed like a subtle problem, but it, it could have turned into a big thing. So we talked about how demonic opposition can sometimes be very Subtle. Now, today we're going to see demonic opposition on a larger scale and in a more visible fashion. So, last week we saw subtlety, and this week we'll see more straight on uh, opposition. But keep in mind that we're aiming towards this goal that even as we see uh, the forces and the powers of darkness trying to destroy the church and destroy believers, we see that the demonic forces do not have the last say because there is victory in Jesus' name. And so demonic opposition will not stop dramatic conversions. And that's the last part of this series. As we move further along in the text and we get into chapter 7 and 8, actually chapter 8, we're going to begin to see these dramatic conversions take place. Because when the Spirit is moving, the forces of darkness will be in retreat. The darkness cannot comprehend the light. When the light is shining from First Baptist Church to Soto, the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot win, okay? So we see this in the text. We're going to let this just flow as the narrative. As we follow the narrative, we're going to see this flow out, and we're going to see how God really does amazing, miraculous things through simple men and women like you and me. He wants to do great things through His church, and He will. So today, we're going to talk about this man, Stephen. And he will dominate our discussion today and next week and even some into the next week as we look at this beautiful life, this beautiful gospel life being lived out in a broken world. And so what we need to do today, right out of the gate, as we read this text, we need to recognize that for you to serve the Lord, it doesn't mean that everything in this world is going to fall into place for you and that all of your troubles will just go away like some, some fog in the morning as the sun comes up. I, I wish that as the sun rises in your heart, as Jesus rises up in your heart, that all the clouds would go away. But we need to prepare ourselves for the broken world. So look, I want to see you live a beautiful gospel life 
But I want to prepare you, as I think the text does, the scriptures do, prepare us for the brokenness of this world. We must have a beautiful message and we must continually share it, but we must expect the rough edges of a broken world to come in contact with our soul. Can't avoid it. Let's look to the text. Here in verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let's pray. God, I ask that you will help us to understand more clearly who Stephen was and help us to see that this life from long ago can teach us much about our lives here today. And I pray, God, that more and more, no matter what the culture is up to, no matter what the uh, the people in this world who do not believe say, I ask that you will help us to be more like Stephen. But above all, Lord, we pray that we will live beautiful gospel lives that bring honor and glory to your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of those very interesting passages of Scripture, one of those uh, verses, so to speak, that flow from the Apostle pen, uh, Paul's pen that really uh, grabs your attention. He's actually quoting from Isaiah 52, 7, but he says this in Romans 10, 15. He says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. That is a very interesting verse, considering that feet are not all that beautiful. But feet represent, here in this context, going. How beautiful it is when someone shows up at your moment of need. When you are down and out, how great it is to have a brother or a sister, a friend, a person who is concerned, there to give a good word to you. Now, we're not quite to Christmas and all the mamas say amen, but this is the language of incarnation. This is the language of God with us when we talk about going, when we talk about being, when we talk about being in the presence of those who need us or when others are in our presence when we need them. And so when I look at this story, the first thing that came to my mind was here we have a living example brought to us in the passage of Scripture of beautiful feet. Stephen had beautiful feet. He's a beautiful example of the Christian life. And if you'll remember from last week, Stephen was not an apostle up until chapter 6. And even there at the first few verses of chapter 6, we're not sure that he is officially a deacon. But here's the main thing you need to get about Stephen. He was called out from among the church. He was called out from among the ranks to wait tables and to serve the needs of the elderly here in the Jerusalem church. But here we start to see that Stephen does more than just wait on tables. He is endowed with a gift of evangelism. He is endowed with a gift of preaching. And even though he's pulled from the rank and file straight out of the pew, he begins to preach with power and might and authority. Listen to me, church. I know that God calls crazy people like me, to do crazy things like this. But when I read this passage, I'm reminded that if we want to see this, this baptistry stirring every week, it's going to be because people in the pews are being stirred by the Spirit to do the work of the kingdom of God. And Stephen is an example of that. 
He doesn't need to have any kind of formal title. He's just going to be a beautiful gospel witness. He is spirit filled. He is wise. He is respected. He is on fire for Jesus. And I'm just going to ask God right now a prayer that I'm going to offer with my eyes wide open that God would call out men and women filled with the Spirit like Stephen at First Baptist Church DeSoto. That you who are here right now in this room, that you will experience some of the blessedness of this gift and these giftings that Stephen had. That you may be on fire for Jesus. Now, I wish I could tell you that when you're on fire for Jesus, the whole world just sets in awe and is so impressed with your commitment to your faith. But we see in this text that those who follow Jesus in a broken world are going to run into some very difficult situations. From the very beginning, as Stephen begins to preach the gospel message, he is running into conflict. In fact, let me just go ahead and put it to you like this. If you really want to be a beautiful witness for Jesus, expect that the world is going to try to crush you. The world, even I don't understand this, it's just because we're so fallen. This world just seems to want to trample beautiful things. Have you ever been at like a botanical gardens or at a, at a park and you see a, a beautiful uh, flower bed or something and you realize that somebody has come through there and just stomped on the flowers and just stomped out something beautiful? And there's just something about that where you go, why would anybody do that? Or to deface a beautiful building or a national landmark or something like that. You see people that will just, just do things to make something beautiful, ugly. And we, we go, why would they do that? And I'll tell you, that's just a visible expression of a broken heart. A, a broken heart apart from God it seems to rebel against beauty itself and wants to take that which is precious and pure and corrupt it. But I want to tell you that even though we have to face that kind of opposition in a fallen world, don't let that kind of evil keep you from being filled with the light of the gospel. Don't let the possibility of trouble from a lost world keep you from the possibilities of being a child of the kingdom, working for the king, and seeing lives transformed by the gospel. Don't let it happen. Don't let the evil of this world have the last laugh or to have the upper hand, but stand firm as we see Stephen doing, as we will see Stephen doing, as we hear him preach to this council in the, uh, the seventh chapter. Colton will be preaching next week, and he'll be going through this sermon of Stephen's, and you'll see that this man, when faced with the challenge, did not back down. He stood firm, and he allowed beautiful feet of the gospel to go in the midst of darkness and pain. He spoke truth. He lived a beautiful gospel life. Friends, I know that when we talk like this, we are, we are setting ourselves up for the paradox of living in this world, the inevitable tensions that come with living a, a gospel life in a world that seems to be just rejecting everything good and wholesome and pure. Stephen needs to guide us not only in his life, but we will see that he guides us even in his death. Stephen is the church's first martyr, as we'll find out in a couple of weeks. But here's what's interesting. Even though I believe that Stephen, from the very beginning, when he was preaching, when he went in front of the council, he, like the other apostles, knew that every time he stood up to preach in the temple, every time he spoke to the Hebrew people and told them that they were not fulfilling the messianic hope, that they were missing the message of the entire Hebrew scriptures, every time they stood up, those men stood up to preach. They knew it could be their last breath. It could be their last moment on earth. And those men, in spite of that possibility, preached the gospel faithfully. Let me ask, what's keeping you from preaching? The gospel faithfully. Is your life on the line if you share your faith with a coworker? I doubt it. Is your life on the, on the line if you go out and, and witness here in this community? I doubt it. I mean, any of us could go and be with the Lord at any moment. But listen, we need to understand that there is a boldness being modeled here that we have lost as a church, as a culture. We need to understand that if this is the truth, we need God to give us the strength to stand firm for it, no matter what the consequences. And Stephen had the face of an angel, even in the face of persecution. He had a deep intimacy with God. 
And I pray that we would desire the same intimacy with God, full of grace and truth. One thought that came to my mind before we dive into some of the specifics here in the text, and this may be an overstatement, but forgive me. Every day you live and every day you're out there and people are watching you. And if if they know you're a Christian, let me just ask you this question. Are you are you modeling the face of an angel or the face of a devil? Now, I know that's extreme, but I want you just to think about your demeanor, your words, your actions, just your just the emotive, uh, the emotive side of this kind of your emotions and how people view you. What are people seeing? Would they see more of Christ or would they see more of the other fellow? Because I I think that it's a constant battle. And I'm saying this to all of you as you begin to think about this, because your witness matters, your presence, your ability to stand firm, even when things aren't going well. How are you handling that? And we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about it in light of the phrase of suffering well, what that looks like, what that means. But before we get there, Let's talk about Stephen being full of grace. Look at verse 8. It's the first phrase used to describe Brother Stephen here is that he was full of grace. Now, when we think about grace, we understand that grace in some ways is kind of the opposite of being, um, you know, uh, legalistic or, you know, just living by the, 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 the black and white, so to speak, rules of the law. Now, grace doesn't mean that we don't believe in the law, but often when we think about grace, what we begin to realize is, is that grace doesn't have a perfect connection with human rationality. So, for instance, if someone does something wrong to you, the world says the just thing to do is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? That's justice. That's right. But grace is more what Jesus said in terms of turning the other cheek. Now, that's hard to do when somebody's punched you in the cheek. And most of the time, even good Christian people will say, well, I don't blame you. I would have beat him up too. Well, of course, that's what you say because you're in the flesh. Of course, that's what we say because that's rational. But I want to tell you that in this world, there is absolutely no way that you are always going to receive justice and give justice. You will at times be unjust to people, even those you love. And there will be times that those you love are unjust to you. And if your life and your well-being and your emotional health is dependent upon everybody treating you right, good luck. Because sometimes you're going to get the short end of the stick. Sometimes you're going to be frauded. Sometimes you are going to be betrayed. And if you let that define you, then you will be the devil. You will not be the angel. If your language is always about what's fair and not fair, let me tell you, you may know how to define grace, but you are not living it. Stephen was full of grace. Stephen, in this passage, not once, here or later, is going to say, this isn't fair. This isn't right. This is not justice. This isn't uh, the proper legal channel to go through. Not once do you see any of that. But instead, you see a man who is full of grace. Now, let's look. Look at this passage. Acts 6, 8 through 15. Here we have a man named Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's doing great wonders and signs among the people, verse 8 tells us. I mean, all of that is good stuff. It's really good stuff. He was caring for widows. We learned in chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. We understand that he's doing all of these things. Not only is he physically caring for those who are hurting, but he's involved in miracles. He's involved in preaching, but in doing all of these things that from maybe our perspective today are positive, notice that he's making people mad. Verse 9 tells us that he's making the people of the synagogue of the freemen. Now, let me say this. The freedmen, they, they might have been free in a political sense, but there's no way they were free in the heart. Because those who persecute the gospel have hearts that are chained up, not set free. So there's irony here, even in their name. They considered themselves free, but I want to tell you, if you don't have Jesus, 
You have the chains of sin. If you don't have Christ, you are tied down by your desires and the idols of your heart. If you want freedom, know Jesus. Period. There is no other way. The heart set free can only be set free by the grace of Jesus Christ. And Stephen was set free. He was set free. This area of Cecilia is interesting. Verse 9 mentions it. And Cecilia is where Tarsus is. Anybody know where, where who came from Tarsus? Paul. So what you have here is a, 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 an informal introduction to Paul, to Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul. Here we see that it doesn't bring out his name, but the people who are arguing with Stephen, one of them almost certainly was Saul of Tarsus. He's in the middle of this, even though his name isn't mentioned. And when we look at this, we see that it wasn't just about a, an academic debate, as it were. But look in verses 11 and 13, and you'll begin to see that those who are attacking Stephen are not doing so with logic and reason and rationality, but with false accusations. They are stirring up the people so that Stephen will be incarcerated. They're looking for mob justice, not any kind of real justice. When the world is against the church, the world will use every method at its disposal to destroy the church. And those who are apart from Christ have no problem telling lies to destroy those who are telling the truth. Now, listen, if you want to tell the truth, you can bet somebody's going to tell a lie about you. If you want to stand for gospel truth, this world is going to try in every way to tear you down. What is Stephen guilty of? Well, he's preaching what Jesus preached. If you look at verses 13 and 14, they say that basically he never ceases to speak words against his holy place and the law. Now, that's, not, that's told from the perspective of the, the adversary. But basically, if you think about it, that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he was preaching. He was talking about a false worship that was taking place at the temple. And he was talking about the false application of the law because the Hebrews were acting as though keeping the law is what saved them, when in fact, the law was what pointing the, pointed them to the need for the Messiah. And so really, all Stephen is doing is saying what Jesus said. In other words, he's preaching the word of God. And they even say, we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now, listen to me. In that passage, you see exactly, again, another connection with the teaching and preaching ministry of Jesus because Jesus said, hey, I'm going to tear down this temple in three days. I'm going to build it again. There is a very clear connection on several levels with the preaching of Jesus. Stephen is effective as a preacher. Listen to this. He is effective as a preacher because he is preaching the message of Jesus. He is preaching from the scriptures and he is allowing the word of God to flow through him. And friends, that's what every Christian needs to do. Not just the one standing in the pulpit, but we need to have lives that are saturated with scripture, saturated with the red words in the print of your Bible and letting those words flow from us and onto a world that is hurting and dying. This is the model. Listen, I know some of you are clever and have some good things to offer the world, but the world doesn't need your cleverness. It needs the cross. The world needs Jesus, not Jeremy, not, not a philosophical system. They need grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all of our sin. That's what the world needs. And the world can get that from Jesus, but those who are full of grace have the capacity to share that grace. And when we are filled with grace, the injustices of the world will not knock us down or keep us from sharing the gospel. Many of us don't appreciate this. Many of us have an, a, an intellectual understanding of grace. But when we are constantly complaining about the unfairness of life, friend, don't don't think for a minute. Don't be deceived. Don't think that you've got grace figured out when all you do is complain. Because you're not getting it. We will not spend our time crying the blues when we understand grace. But we will instead count our blessings. Those who don't get grace cry the blues. Those who do get grace count their blessings. What a difference. And the church today needs this more than anything else. Because here in our culture, we are so 
autonomous. It's all about me. It's all about my rights. I mean, look at all the political arguments and all the division in politics. It's because everybody wants me, 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 my, my, mine, my demographic, my need, my this, my that. Listen, church, you can't get in that argument because it's never going to be about what you need most. It's about what the world needs most, and that's Jesus. And if you've found it, then you've found grace. Be full of it and share it. Quit complaining about what you don't have when you have salvation in the name of Jesus. Quit complaining about unfairness when the world is always going to be unfair. But Jesus, he looked at you and he knew every single one of your faults and saved you from your sins. Man, let that carry the day. Full of grace. Full of grace. And so, listen, I... The concept of grace is not merely theological. It is practical. I've read some good books on grace, but there's not, nothing better than experiencing it. I, I, can, I can quote this and quote that and tell you this and tell you that, but ultimately, when grace is really working, there aren't any words to articulate, to define it, to break it down, to deconstruct it. Grace is absolutely of God. Amen. Stephen was full of grace. We need to be too. Stephen was full of power. And I'm going to be short here on this point, and you laugh and say whatever. But anyway, Stephen was full of power. If you look at this text, and as Colton is preaching next week, as you get into chapter 7, a man on trial for his life, being persecuted by people, being lied about and to by people, that person doesn't seem to have that much power. That person actually, by definitions that we would set in a fallen world, Stephen is the man in this text with no power at all. He has no power at all. His life is on the line. His reputation is being drugged through the mud. Now listen, again, Stephen's crime is is that he wasn't playing by the Hebrew rules. His crime was he wasn't sticking with the traditional teaching. That was his crime. But look at the things that they're saying about him. They're calling him a blasphemer. They're, they're saying that he's lying about Moses, that he's making stuff up about the word of God. I mean, in that culture, these were the worst things you could say about another human being. Now, listen, if you want to be filled with the spirit, you have to get ready for this. And you need to realize that people in powerful positions are going to sometimes seem to have the upper hand. But I want to tell you, when we have the least amount of power in this world, that is when we have the most amount of power spiritually. I know you've probably been following the news this week. I haven't read as much about it as I would like, but I am aware that the Christian church in China is being persecuted in the last seven days on a level that hasn't been seen in perhaps decades. Men and women of faith in China are losing their lives this very day, I would imagine, for their faith. Now, let me tell you, when we think about things like that, and we, we, we come to, to grips with the fact that the Chinese government has all the power. What we need to also realize here is that the Chinese church is growing probably 50 times faster than the American church. So in a place where, from a perspective of politics, the church has no power. Are you following my line of logic here? They are filled with what? Spiritual power. And here in America, where we politically have really nothing to worry about, oh yeah, you complain about things that happen here and there, but listen, you have absolute freedom to go this afternoon and go to lunch and share the gospel with your waiter or waitress, and you're not going to go to jail. They won't baptize you in China until you know who your partner is going to be in jail. You decide who you're going to spend jail time with before they'll baptize you. There, were, there, there are places in the world where they won't baptize you until you say, I am ready to live for Christ and I am ready to die for Christ. And in places like that, spiritual power is unstoppable. Now, I don't know what to do because I'm not praying for the, 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 the situation to change here in that regard. But I'm saying this, we have been given much and much is required of us. And if we want power, listen, I, I hope this doesn't offend you, don't care if it does, but power... Power isn't going to come through the channels of the government. Because that power, if we try to force Christianity on people through legislation or whatever, listen, that's never going to work. The power that the world needs 
is the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through men like Stephen and men and women like us. Now, I'm not saying we don't get involved in politics. I'm not saying that we just leave that or kick that can down the road. But what I'm saying is, don't let that be your passion and your focus. It will be a dead end, I promise you. But when we are filled with the power of Jesus, there is no stopping us. The Chinese officials are finding it out right now. Because the more they try to stamp out the flame of Christ, the more it spreads. That's power. And that's what we need. We see that Stephen was full of grace and power. The other apostles were too. And people who are filled with the power of God don't bellyache about their circumstances, but they pray for more boldness in the face of persecution. Look at chapter 4. People who are truly on fire for God are not praying to save their own skin. They're praying to be more bold no matter what comes at them. And I don't know that the American church has prayed this way in a long time. But we can and we must because that's what God would have us do. Here is a man who's filled with power. He's a preacher. He has the ability to to, to see miracles taking place around him. God gives him these gifts. I don't understand them all, but they're there. And I want to tell you, this is power that the world doesn't know what to do with. It is a power that Jesus promised. In fact, Jesus told his disciples in Luke 21... He said this, he said that you, my followers, will speak with wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. That's what Jesus told his disciples. And in a way, it comes uh, true here in Acts chapter 4, but also here in Acts chapter 6 with Stephen, not just with the apostles, but now we see with deacons too, a deacon like Stephen. God is able to work. And he is able to give these men power to stand up against the greatest minds of the day, those who have all the power, and to stand and with power proclaim the gospel. No man can outthink God. No mortal can debate with his creator. When the power of God is flowing through us, people may try to argue, but they can't win. I want to tell you what Caleb testified of to a moment ago. The smartest man in America, the smartest man in the world can't argue with his testimony because it's his. And when you have Jesus and you have a testimony, the smart guys out there, they can make fun of you, they can laugh at you, but they can't take away the joy of your salvation. There's power there. Don't forget it. There is power. You are full of power as Stephen was. And I I fear that many of us as believers, we don't share our faith because we are afraid that we won't be able to win the debate or, uh, you know, if we get in an argument with a non-believer that somehow they're going to have the upper hand. Maybe they have two degrees and I don't have any. Or maybe they read philosophy and, and I barely read. Listen, I want to tell you, God doesn't need you with degrees hanging on the wall. What he needs you to be is a faithful, bold witness and he will give you the words to say. He will, he will put words in your mouth. Now, listen, I talk a lot. I know that's a surprise to you. I talk a lot. And there are times when I say stuff and I'm like, that was really dumb. And there are other times where I say stuff and I'm like, where'd that come from? I wasn't even thinking about that. I haven't read that in 20 years. Where'd that come from? Well, I know where it came from. That's God at work. And your mind, well, you're all weird, but your mind is a weird thing. And, and everything that you've ever experienced in life is locked in there some ways. The problem is most of us can't figure out where we put it. But God knows. God knows exactly where it's at. Every victory you've experienced in Christ is locked in there somewhere. Every scripture you've ever read is locked in there somewhere. Every testimony you've ever heard is locked in there somewhere. Every single book you've read that really encouraged you and showed you a great deep truth It's in there. And guess what? When the moment comes and you need it most, Jesus will find it for you. And you will speak. And God will quicken a dead soul. And a new new soul will be in heaven someday. And the angels in glory will sing. Friends, that's power. Power. Stephen was also filled with wisdom. Today, when we think about knowledge and wisdom in America, we're really good at knowledge. Um, Those who, who go to school... Um, they, they'll study and, and, and learn all of these facts and, and store up vast amounts of knowledge. But the problem is we have a culture that, that uh, because our phones can connect us with any factoid, 
in the world in an instant second, less than a second. Uh, we are full of facts, but we have no wisdom. We're 100 miles wide and not even an inch deep. We know facts, but we don't know truth. We, we have some knowledge, but we don't have wisdom. I want to tell you, Stephen had more than just facts. Now, when you listen to the sermon that Stephen preached in chapter 7, you're going to see that he had a lot of knowledge. He, he really did. He understood his Bible better than we do, I'm sure, his Old Testament better than we do. But it's not just the knowledge that's going to grab your attention. What's going to grab your attention is the wisdom and how God has shown him how it all connects together and brings us to the foot of the cross. You see, that's what the Bible is. There is nothing in the Bible, nothing, not one single word, not even those nine chapters of genealogies that don't some way, somehow point us to Jesus. Not every passage enlivens uh, us or, or, or opens our minds in a profound way to the gospel, but every verse is aiming in that direction. And I think that the more we study God's word, as Stephen obviously did, the more we are able to connect people with the only hope of salvation this world has. Stephen's preaching, again, I mentioned it earlier, so I won't uh, talk about it too much here, but in verses 13 and 14, Stephen is preaching Jesus. So, church, what are you going to preach? Jesus. Preach Jesus. Tell people about him. As God brings to your memory the stories of the Bible, the stories of the Gospels, tell people about Jesus. Remind them of how great he is. I believe with all my heart, I believe that all of us, we can know the mind of Christ. As Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. We can know the mind of Christ if we are in Christ. And if we will allow Christ to fill us, if we will stick close to him, I promise you, when the moment comes and you need wisdom, Christ will speak through you. I'm always telling people, God spoke through a donkey. He can speak through this Baptist too. God can do anything. He is limitless. Don't allow yourself to think that your knowledge somehow will, will make the difference. No, what makes the difference is when the mind of Christ overwhelms your mind. And when the mind of Christ overwhelms your mind, you will have, you will have grace that's coming from your mouth, not justice. You will have power, not to control people like the world does, but power to help people see the brokenness of their sin and to see their need to be saved by grace. I'm telling you, that's what God can do. That's what God wants to do. Oh, how great it would be for you every day to be in the Word of God. I hope you are. If you're not, let me encourage you to be so. In the Word every day. Because every day you're in the Word Every day you'll be more wise. You'll know more of the mind of God. I'm convinced that the world doesn't need more people filled with knowledge. The world needs more people like you filled with Christ. And I'm a man who spent a lot of my life trying to fill my mind with knowledge. I, I, I'm not saying it's, it's bad. So Colton, it's okay. It's okay. Keep reading your books. And I'll keep reading my books. We'll be okay, brother. I, I'm not preaching a Guinness. But, you know, I, I know a lot of people who are well-read maybe even in theology, but they, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I want you to, to have the depth of wisdom and the, and, the, and the knowledge. That's fine, too. But ultimately, I, I want to see God take complete control of you, mind, body, and soul. Because the more, the more this community sees Christ in us, the more we're going to have to add services, you know, service times. So we're going to fill this building again and again and again as long as people see Christ. Here, Stephen is spirit-filled. That's the last point, really, is that he was spirit-filled. I know that today in our culture, we think about the uh, extremes of the charismatic movement, and so often Baptists are scared to death of being called charismatic. I don't know. I think we ought to be more afraid of people calling us dead just me. Now, you know me, I, I, I'm not going to give in to uh, any extra biblical expression of worship. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to allow that as best I can. I'm going to try to be very faithful in this regard. But I want to tell you, if our goal is to be, you know, just flat, boring, dead, then nobody's going to want to be here with you. I mean, you're great and all. 
But if we if if people come in here and they don't sense the joy of the Lord, are you shocked that they don't stay? I want to tell you. I've thought a lot about this because, you know, my energy, my feelings, you know, I can't every time, (laughs) even this morning, a couple people say, you doing okay?" I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like this. Dynamite has to be focused and concentrated so that when it explodes, the right things get hit. That's what I said. So I'm doing all right, but I just needed to blow up in a good way, okay? So I've been saving my energy, okay? So, so hear me out. I believe so much that a broken world needs more power than I have. And more power than we have collectively even as human beings. I believe this world needs a church filled with the Holy Spirit. And and it's a sweet, sweet thing when the church is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to take this too far. You can do with this what you want. But if my Savior can heal a broken heart, he can heal a broken arm. I won't limit him. And you, if you do, you do at your own peril. The God of Scripture is the creator of the universe. And his power is limited by nothing. He is limitless. And I just feel, don't you, when we come to church, it's so often the conversations more sound like what we're limited to or what we're restra- in ways we're restrained and constricted. But when I, when I see these, these people in the Bible in Acts or even Jesus, I don't sense that he is chained down, man. He is let loose. He's crazy. He's filled with fire and power and passion because he is spirit-filled. I'm a human being. I can be in one place at one time, but I want to tell you the Holy Spirit can be inside of every one of us at the same time, leading us in the same direction to do kingdom work. God is able to do that. So here in the last, we see that these individuals are making a case against Stephen to have him killed. They're gazing at him, those who sat in the council. And what did they see? They saw the demeanor of an angel. It's hard to keep a calm face, to have serenity in your face when people are making false accusations about you. It's hard to be calm, cool, and collected when this body, which is the only one you have, is being threatened to be destroyed. Friends, I I, I hope you hear today, there's not enough rah-rah cheerleading I can do to put this truth in your heart. What we're talking about here today is the work of God and the Spirit in you. And Christ, I believe, because of his death on the cross, has made all of this possible. Stephen is about to die, but he has the demeanor of an angel. And an angel dwells in the presence of God and thus shines with a fraction of God's glory. Now, I want to say to each of you today that I believe that the more time you spend with Christ, in Christ, I believe that you too can have the demeanor of an angel because the more time you spend with Christ, the more just a fraction of that glory will rub off on you. Stephen was a man who had managed to get close enough to Jesus. Now, not in a physical sense. He wasn't an apostle, so there's no evidence that he ever met Jesus in the flesh. But because of his prayer life, because of his time in the Word, this man dwelled in the presence of Jesus. And he had the presence and the demeanor of an angel. He had a glow about him, I believe. Now, here's what's ironic, is that these individuals who are accusing Stephen of being a bad dude, one of the things they're saying is, is that he is, he's knocking down Moses, that he's putting down Moses. But here's the interesting thing. There are two people in the Scripture that are, are well, to count Stephen here, there's one other person in Scripture that the Bible tells us got in the presence of God and his face shone brightly. Who was that? It was Moses. So what's funny is, is that the very person they're saying that, that Stephen is knocking down or, or disrespecting, has Stephen is like Moses in as much as there's something different about his demeanor. And I want to tell you, I believe that our detractors are always going to find something to throw at us, a stone to throw at us. But if we will just be in Christ, they can say whatever they want, and our faces will still glow with the glory of God. The brokenness of this world will draw blood. 
It will hurt. But we do not have to allow that brokenness to define us. We must cling fiercely to Christ so that our faces can shine with his glory. The world will draw blood, brothers and sisters. Like I said, it will hurt. On average, we do not suffer well. When we're hurting, people don't see Jesus in us. They don't see the face of an angel. I'm not asking for you to just figure this out today because there is no rational way to figure out how to calculate, construe, or to navigate through pain. But I believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, even when the world is pressing down on you hard, it is possible for you to have the face of an angel. And I'm praying for you, not just today, but this week, that when the pressures of this world begin to collapse down on you, which they inevitably will, if not this week, next week, right? If not the next, the next. But as that pressure starts to bear down, the frown will not come to your face. But a smile from heaven, the face of an angel, the glory of God. Because see, the broken world will always be broken until Jesus returns. But what we can do, what we can do is something beautiful that stands out, that brings the light of of God, the gospel, his glory into the world. And I just want you today and me and all of us to get this glow in our lives because the world needs it. The darkness is real. The difficulties are true. But listen, the light of Christ, let it flow through you. We talk about revival. We talk about spiritual awakening, enlightenment, whatever you want. Listen, the world needs Jesus. Why not us? Why why can't it be us? Why can't we have the face of an angel. I think we can. Let's ask God. Let's ask God in all of his grace and mercy to help us suffer well and love well so that the kingdom of God will advance. Let's pray.